You know, Dominicans are storytellers, if nothing else. So uh, tonight I'm going to begin this talk about the Dominican tradition by telling a story. And I'm going to beg the forgiveness of my Dominican sisters, because I'm sure they have heard this a gazillion times. <clears throat> but it's, very, it's a story that's very central to understanding what it means to be part of the Dominican family and part of the Dominican tradition. And this is a story that I offer at tonight. So the year was 1511. And a small group of Dominican friars, headed by Pedro de Cordoba, departed from the convent of the University of Salamanca in Spain, and they arrived in Hispaniola, the island, of course, that is now inhabited by the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And the Dominicans were sent to Hispaniola in order to serve the pastoral needs of the Spanish conquistadors. But it wasn't long before this small group of Dominicans became aware of the cruel treatment of the indigenous people at the hands of the Spanish overlords. And in one of the most complete examples of genocide in world history, the indigenous of Hispaniola were murdered for resisting the theft of their resources, the exploitation of their labor, the abuse of their children, the rape of their women. Many died from wounds that were inflicted by the Spanish whips and guns, and others just perished from exhaustion in the gold mines. Still others died from the European diseases uh, to which their bodies were no immunity. How can so many people perish so cruelly? The Dominican missionaries began to ask. And although this question might be viewed today as indicating a certain kind of naivete, the question was much more than it seemed. The question was really an indication that the Dominican missioners had stepped out of their role as pastoral collaborators in the conquest. Their ministry, which functioned in part to sanction the prevailing economic and religious worldview of Spain, in fact sanctioning the conquest, was now being rethought and recalibrated by the Dominicans. How can so many people perish so cruelly? The question was not as simple as it sounded. In part, it indicated the Dominicans' willingness to decline the benefits of being the beneficiaries of the Spanish conquest. The question indicated that the Dominican tradition of reflecting on experience through the lens of the thinking heart was pulsing in them, directing them to listen, to look again, and to discern a new direction for mission. The question indicated that submitting their experience, their experience of the conquest, to critical and ethical analysis, to the gospel tradition, to their contemplative hearts, was leading them to a truth that they were now obliged to teach and preach. So aware of the gravity and the consequences of preaching against the motives and the means by which the Spaniards were colonizing Hispaniola, the Hispaniola Dominicans, this young group of Dominicans, decided that they would communally compose a homily and they would deliver it to the conquistadors and call them to repentance and change. I wonder who had that idea. <laughs> It would be delivered, they decided, by Antonio de Montesinos, their strongest preacher. On the first Sunday of Advent, 1511, 500 years ago, all the notables of the island, among them Diego Colon, the son of Christopher Columbus, gathered as usual for Mass. The preacher began, I love this opening, mm -hmm. you are in mortal sin. <laughs> That'll wake you up at church, right? <laughs> you live in it and you die in it. Why? Because of the cruelty and the tyranny you use on these innocent people. On what authority have you waged such detestable wars on them in their peaceful lands? How is it that you hold them so crushed and exhausted, giving them nothing to eat or any treatment for the diseases that you inflict on them yourselves? Are they not human beings? Have they not rational souls? Are you not obliged to love them as you love yourself? Do you understand this? Know this for certain. Given the state you're in, you cannot be saved. That was Sunday's homily. <laughs> so the furor 
that erupted in the congregation that Sunday then propelled Admiral Colon, the son of Christopher Columbus, to drum the door of the Dominican Priory. He demanded that Montesinos retract what he said or be arrested for treason. Colon accused the Dominicans not only of treason, but of being scandal monitor, monitor, mongers and of heresy. Prior Cardoba, poor guy, he's at the door, and he responds, but Admiral Colon, I cannot release Father Montesinos to you because the entire Dominican community composed the preaching given that, uh, that Sunday. Admiral, you're going to have to arrest us all. So Admiral Colon, momentarily deterred by this unexpected response, then issued a warning to the Dominicans before he departed, desist or face imprisonment. The next Sunday, in an atmosphere of great tension, the conquistadors and families gathered again at the Dominican house for mass. The preacher, Montesinos, once again now to the pulpit. Slowly and deliberately, he repeated the themes of the previous week's preaching. However, in the Dominicans' ongoing reflection on the cruelty and oppression they were witnessing, the Dominican community of Hispaniola were moved to take another step toward inviting the Spanish to conversion. At the conclusion of this second homily, Montesinos warned that the Dominicans would deny the sacraments and the absolution to the Spanish colonists if they persisted in their disrespectful regard and violent treatment of the native people of Hispaniola. Now because this past Sunday, fourth, first Sunday of Advent 2011, marked the 500th anniversary of the Hispaniola homily, you may have heard this homily preached more than once and certainly subjected to exegesis a few times. Although you might be familiar with the dynamics surrounding the communal effort to write the Hispaniola homily and the selection of the preacher, Antonio de Montesinos, what might not be as well known is how the missioners, how their experience in Hispaniola became the content of the research and the debates that were underway at the Dominican University in Salamanca, Spain. This part of the story, I think, is really the ground where the interrelatedness, the possibilities, the collaborative nature of Dominican apostolic mission and the experience, their experience of ministering within the social context of their day, whatever day that is, and the rigorous <coughs> study and ethical reflection upon it, it illuminates some of the most critical dimensions of Dominican mission. Critical engagement with and study of the signs of the times in the light of the gospel and Catholic social teaching. <coughs> Francisco de Vitoria, a Dominican professor specializing in what we would call today political theology, was intensely engaged with the most contested issues of the day. <coughs> so he's in Spain and he's their teacher. They came from him to the colony. He was dealing with the issues, the contested issues of the day of the powers of the Pope, the right and wrong methods of spreading the Christian faith, <coughs> and the rights of the newly, quote, discovered people to possess their own land and to govern themselves. Victoria's study in Spain of Spain's conquest thousands of miles away led him to challenge Spain's actions towards the communities of non-Christian indigenous people in the Spanish courts and, and debate halls of the university. He became the advocate of the indigenous. He challenged the propaganda that they posed a threat to the Spanish monarchy and to Christendom. In the process of his study of these issues, Vittoria was moved to dismiss the popular claim that the Pope and the European monarchs had the right to create the encomienda system, a policy through which the conquistadors had sovereignty over the indigenous lands. Vittoria argued the rights of the indigenous to their land in court, the scholar Dominican challenged Spain's claims that the lands were uninhabited. Simply stating the obvious, Victoria retorted the lands were not inhabited, indigenous people lived there. In his assessment, 
of the church's complicity in the conquest, Victoria concluded the Pope had no authority to promote Christianity at gunpoint or to bless the endeavor of conquest. Pretty brave, right? Like Christ, Victoria argued, the Pope has no temporal power over the indigenous or any other unbeliever. Furthermore, Victoria took the then radical view that the Pope and the Church should have no direct influence in the questions of who should assume state leadership. You have to remember this as, as we approach our own yeah, elections. Keep that in mind. The legal and the scholarly positions of Victoria about the rights of the indigenous were derived from Victoria's understanding of natural law and his conclusions that the law of nature became a public law that, re that regulated relations between territories. Eventually, it became known as international law. It applied to the conduct and grounds for war as well. Incredible, right? Mm -hmm. In 11. With this formula, Victoria signaled the end of political universalism of the Middle Ages, and he denied the superior right of Christian princes to conquer and rule over remote so-called heathen people by virtue of the latter's religious errors. Victoria's scholarship and successful legal arguments led to policies designed to end the encomienda system of land seizure by colonists in the so-called New World. Now, in the garden of the United Nations on First Avenue in New York City, there is a tribute to the Spanish Dominican professor of Salamanca whose work continues to be one of the most significant contributions to international law and human rights. Under a bronze bust of the Dominican preacher are these words, Francisco de Vitoria, OP, founder of international law and human rights. For all of us, members of the contemporary Dominican family there is much to harvest from the rich deposit of tradition found in the story of the Hispaniola homily and the advocacy for justice that inspired it. I have chose to begin this reflection on teaching, learning, and engaging the Dominican mission in a complex world with the story of the homily because as a Dominican teacher and preacher and justice promoter, I believe the homily contains some of the most critical components of Dominican tradition, mission, and identity. I have selected three of these components to share in this reflection. And as we unpack these elements of Dominican tradition a bit more, I hope you see in them some of that which distinguishes the teaching and learning of a college or university that is rooted in the Dominican tradition. Three aspects of the Dominican tradition, mission, and identity amplified in the homily are the Dominican commitments to upholding human rights and human dignity, the Dominican commitment to sustainable and ethical social, economic, and environmental development, and the Dominican commitment to peace building. These are just three that I'm lifting up. First, let's look at the first one, human dignity and rights. For Dominicans, the incarnation event is one of the most essential truths confirming that God dwells within us, with us, and that we dwell in God. This is true for everyone who lives, moves, and has being. In everyone and everything that is created, God is. Therefore, all is good, all has beauty, all deserves dignity and rights because all is created by God and God is this truth that God is in us and with us is not just a consolation, but a commitment visible in Dominican contemplation and in Dominican mission. Because we are called to live, teach, preach the truth, Dominicans are promoters and protectors of the beauty, respect, and dignity that are the inalienable rights of all life. Because we are all of God and we are all in God, Dominicans preach the truth of creation's intrinsic relatedness. As the science of the origins and the growth of the cosmos reveal, and I know that the freshmen, I think, study that, right, in their insight program here, the creator's design for our world 
is relationship. That's the design. And as Francisco de Vitoria confirmed, there is in creation, this was his argument in the courts, this was his logic in the courts of Spain, this was his logic in, in, in the classroom. There is in creation an irrevocable bond of relationship between all things. Relatedness is intrinsic to Dominican spirituality, identity, and our world view. And relatedness is visible in Dominican mission through acts of compassion, advocacy, and solidarity. Because of our conviction of intrinsic relatedness, Dominicans, more often than not, refer to our order as a family. By calling ourselves a family, we're witnessing and preaching the truth that God's creative design for all human beings, all beings, is relatedness, is family. For me, one of the 20th century literature's most poignant discourses about this profound ontological and theological truth comes from Alice Walker's memorable character, Shoghi Ori. In Walker's book, The Color Purple, Shoghi says to Celia, I believe God is in everything. Everything that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy that you, that you have found it, well, that's great. My first step from the old white man was trees, then air, then birds, then other people. But one day, when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it came to me, that feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all, and I knew that if I cut a tree, my own arm would bleed. <clears throat> Although the creator's design for the world is right relationship, a virulent and recurrent challenge to the truth of creation's relatedness is one of the most insidious heresies reappearing in various forms throughout history, the heresy of dualism, the worldview that perceives creation is intrinsically flawed, separate, disassociated, disordered, and alienated from God. 12th century European society was populated by persons who believed themselves and their lives to be evil, sinful, and fated for eternal damnation. It was in this context that the founder of the Dominican Order, Dominic Guzman, picked up his ministry in relationship to this heresy of dualism. Some outcomes of this worldview that perceive the human person as being so basically so evil included infanticide and suicide. Ostracisms and death could be the fate of those who challenge this popular stream of religious belief and cultural understanding. The whole of southern France was filled with the Cathars and the Albigensi, and it became a part of the cultural fabric you know, of the land. Dominic's persuasive preaching of God's intimate presence within and with the human person and with all of the creation was a powerful rebuttal to the logic of the heresy of dualism. Moreover, his compassion, his respect, his affection for victims as well as perpetrators of the heresy were genuine and equally effective witness. Unlike the clerics of his day, he did not perceive Dominican religious life as being separate from people, but in fact as dwelling with and among people the social and dealing with the same social realities that they were of the day. His mission was successful, and the first to join the Dominican family were women converts from the heresy. Some people say that that tradition of having women heretics in the order has persisted. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this avowing the heresy, which organized this, the women who stepped out of the heresy, people who, who sort of disavowed themselves of it, that action had consequences had severe social consequences for them. It's particularly for women, they needed a community. Once they left this culture, they needed a community with which to grow and live into their new understanding, and they also needed the protection of a new family as they experienced banishment and the threat of deaths, even from their own family of origin. So that's how the Dominican 
order really began in response to the heresy of dualism, and the Dominican community was really conceived initially as a place where those who were stepping out of this dominant worldview could experience community and family and relatedness. Because leaving this family of origin, leaving this other culture, leaving this way of life had consequences. And people could be very easily isolated and, in fact, hurt. Now, following Dominic's footprints, uh, but on a slightly different pathway, was the scholar Thomas Aquinas. He also tangled with dualism as he studied and critiqued the philosophy of Plato. And he was influenced, of course, by his teacher, Aubrey Magnus, whom the college was named. And Thomas's disciplined study and his extraordinarily uh, talented intellectual capacities led Thomas to reject, in his time, the Platonic worldview that really organized all the logic and the thinking and the study and you know how we conceived of, of life. And instead, Thomas began to say that both matter and spirit, they're not separated as in the dualistic worldview, but in fact are connected in the human person, that we're integrated, that we're one. And Thomas asserted that it was by reason of the unity of our matter, of matter and spirit, that it is through this unity of flesh and spirit that human beings know God. That it's not just a matter of our spiritual ascent of our bodies or the spiritual ascent of the world around us, but in fact it's a matter of our being in touch with reality, creation, friendship, sustainable ethical economic development. It's ever more important. Growing global and national disparities in wealth and in wages and in earned income are increasingly related to questionable economic ideologies, policies, and systems. We are increasingly aware that today's economic strategies continue to present significant threats to human and planetary thriving. Some have described the dynamics of the contemporary economic development model as the manifestation of the Bangkok Bangkokcy of the, the neo-colonial era. So let's look, take a look quickly at the reality of global disparities. You've probably seen these numbers before. Today, 51% of the world's assets, owned by 2% of the world's population. Over 50% of the population lives on less than $2 a day. And in the United States, 75% of the wealth is probably contained within 10% of the folks, and the top 1% of those folks manage quite a bit of it. So the, the net, work, uh, net worth of US top 1% is $21.9 trillion, more wealth than is shared by the bottom 99% of the population. So in terms of the US, 50.1% uh, 50 of the US population lives under the poverty line. The poverty rate of persons who are black is close to double, remember the dualism, is close to double that of persons who are white. In 2010, black and Hispanic families earned a year 57 cents to every dollar that was earned by whites. Well, who bears the burden of these disparities? Increasing percentages of the general population bear the burden, but dis uh, disproportionately represented within this group are people of color and children. Now, in terms of disparities within the state of Connecticut, despite you guys having the fourth highest rate of income in the United States, Last year, Connecticut was second only to Nevada in the nation's rate of household income decline. Almost 10% of the people of the state of Connecticut live in poverty. 23% of those who are in poverty are Hispanic, 22 are black, and 6% are white. 12.1% is your state rate of uh, child poverty. However, there are cities within your state where this is child poverty is disproportionately represented. Hartford is quite honestly shocking. 39%. Wyndham, not sure where that is, but that's 20, almost 25%. Uh, East Haven, New Haven, North Fork, East have this is your background, your backyards, right? 15% of child poverty. And this is, wasn't enough to consider the victims of economic injustice in our own country are further imperiled by the fact that every time we have an economic downturn, we have these downturns have a very distressful impact on the social, political policies and programs that have been engineered to protect the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So while these rates are rising, the programs are actually being gutted, as we know. So at a time when they're most needed, 
they're not available. <coughs> so how do we understand these global and national economic disparities and how do we assess them in the light of the gospel and Catholic social tradition and Dominican tradition? The Catholic Church's response to the forces shaping the global economy and disparities has been notable. For instance, the center of concern. And as much as you know, we can say, what is the church doing about this? Actually, the church has a lot of great stuff to say about these issues. The center of concern is our Catholic think tank in Washington, D.C., where Jesuits and Dominicans work together happily and in peace. <laughs> and uh, the Dominican, Maria Riley, who's absolutely brilliant, has um, really created um, a paper Called, it's been on NPR, she's been interviewed all over, which is her revisioning of what an economy of right relatedness would look like. I mean, she's, she's just really brilliant. Um, so, anyway, worth reading, and it's on your website. I would say Catholic Relief Services, another Catholic agency. We are an international relief and development agency. We work over 100 con uh, countries. And we're providing some excellent resources for the university students to kind of engage in these issues, these global issues, in ways that will help them not only know about them, but to use their significant advocacy in ways that help affect the policy change. So we're not, knowing is not enough. We're trying to get the students to actually take steps forward. And we have some resources, and I share them with some of the faculty today. Network, if you don't belong, you should belong to the network, the National Catholic social justice lobby, sometimes it's called a nun's lobby, but everybody can belong to it. Um, and it's been run over the years uh, by Dominican sisters of many different congregations and others. Right now they have a fabulous campaign for students called Mind the Gap, which is helping students look at national and global disparities. Just to let you know that all of these, what's really interesting about, and I, I love Oxfam, and I love Bread for the World, I love all these groups that are also the one campaign, they're all terrific. But what's really great is that these wonderful social justice organizations are all looking through the lens of Catholic social teaching at these contemporary issues. So students are sort of getting it by osmosis, you know, as they're engaging with it. And they get, they get to see Catholic uh, social teaching engaged in very significant ways. And interestingly enough, the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. You probably have read it. I think the Times published a lot of it. They published an important analysis and guidance concerning the present crisis of the global economy, and it's called Toward Reforming the International Financial and Monetary Systems in the Context of Global Public Authority. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the Vatican has really taken a very critical, hard look the way the economic, uh, economic systems are operating and the assumptions around it. They're struggling with the errors that are inherent in economic and financial policies. The Vatican is speaking about the structural weaknesses of political, economic, and financial institutions and are really talking about the collusion that exists among these and why they're no longer effective, the strange bedfellows. And they're talking about an insidious culture, global, of materialism, and uh, utilitarian, utilitarianism. Um, and there's some recommendations that I think have made some people's hair stand up that the Vatican uh, has expressed. And one is that the Vatican's Pontifical Justice Commission says that, okay, so we're telling you, we're criticizing this, we know this is not working for the poor, we're obligated to give some recommendations, so hold on to your chair, hear us up first. We need a global public central authority to govern the global economic system through a global governance structure. Now, you know how people love that regulation and so on and so forth, right? <laughs> the Vatican is saying we need taxation measures on all financial transactions with charges that are proportionate to the complexity of the financial operation. And furthermore, the taxation revenue that we take from these financial uh, transactions should be used to promote global development in countries that really, really need it. And it will also contribute to the creation of a reserve fund to help economies when they go into crisis. So they have some really good recommendations. The third recommendation is that the public, that we should be using public funds to recapitalize banks. Why don't we sort of do that? <laughs> and, <laughs> But the Vatican is saying we should use it as leverage. In other words, just don't give them the money and bail them out, but to say, look, if you're not behaving ethically, you are done, right? Because 
we bailed you out, you're out of here. Uh, if you go back to business as usual, it's over. And their fourth recommendation is that we need a more transparent definition of the domains of ordinary credit and investment banking so as to eliminate shadow markets. And God knows we have a lot of those. So um, now, the question that the Vatican also entertains is, you know, if we're talking about building up a broad consensus, if we've really got to educate people to transform the society, who are we going to turn to to help us to educate folks about the economy and to get people to think ethically about it? Where are the networks out there who are working with people that we can use those networks to re-educate people toward a more just economy? And guess what the Vatican points to? Catholic colleges and universities. They really want them to take this on as a big project and in fact begin to shape students' consciousness in this direction. You probably have also heard that another group of people who have been really successful in terms of looking at the economy has been the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. A couple years ago, they wrote a great pastoral called Economic Justice for All, and they lay out a number of principles that I'm not going to go into, but are very, very interesting in terms of these are the principles that we should be looking at our economy to figure out whether or not the economy is working for people rather than have people working just for the economy. So, so some of the questions that this second issue about you know, Dominicans want to be looking at any Dominican college university, the Dominican family always wants to have, have its eye on, you know, what are sustainable and ethical means to development, economic development, political development, social development, environmental development. So the question for us is, how are we, members of this university community, shaped by Dominican and Catholic social teaching traditions, nurturing the development of students and teachers who will participate in the creation of economic systems which promote the thriving of the human person, global and national development. So this is a question for the president and for the dean, right? To really say, well, you know, we need to engage the social issues of the day. We're a Dominican school, and this is our tradition, just as in the Hispaniola homily. What else should we be looking at? Now, I'm not saying Albertus isn't, because I, I've heard a lot about your student body and the way that you're bringing assets to your student body and how incredibly you're concerned about the integral human development of your student body and building up their assets to do this. But we're always pushing the envelope one more step, right? So the question is, what place does this university have in creating a more just and economic uh, state, right, nation, and the world? And the question is, how will you leverage your position as a great university in the state, in this neighborhood, so that real change, real social justice, the, the culture of right relation, relatedness will really prevail. And the third and last topic will be on peace building. Catching up with me? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> I skip a lot. So, another sort of preoccupation, corporate preoccupation of the Dominican order is about the work of peace building. <coughs> And uh, just as I began this with a story, I'm going to end it with a story. So one Sunday, uh, a few years ago, I drove to Newark Airport to pick up uh, two of my colleagues. Their names are Melody and Huma, and they are Catholic Relief Services staff in Afghanistan. And we introduced ourselves, and then briefly we kind of reviewed our itinerary. We're going to be in New York together doing some work. And one of the women, Kuma Sapi, an Afghan national, she asked me ever so gently, Arlene, will you take me to the site? Now this is a fairly common request that first time is to New York, yes, for New Yorkers. And most of us New Yorkers have probably granted this request a gazillion times. But this time, with Huma, this time, the question jolted. And it felt different to me. And I was a little disoriented about her request. I heard myself say, of course, Huma, of course I'll take you there. But I knew that someplace deep within me, I was still catching up with Afghan Huma's question, will you take me to the site? So a few moments later, again, we went through the Holland Tunnel, we get to Lower Manhattan, we park on Broadway. And the mid-morning sun was just cresting. The 
those multi-layered skyscrapers that were once dwarfed by the Twin Towers. She moved silently through shears of light from one billboard, I don't have names, one billboard to the next. And she was pausing now and then in a kind of thoughtful reflection of the story that those billboards were telling her about September 11, 2001. I felt like I was shadowing her pilgrimage, a private moment that was unveiling in a very public place. But others watched her as well. There was something about her singularly solemn presence to the moment that drew attention. Curiously and respectfully, they began to make room for her as she made her way from beginning to the end of the carefully detailed account on her billboards. She took a few more steps, then she paused, and she looked up, and then I watched her hold their names in her beautiful brown eyes. And suddenly, she just knelt down. Her black shador caressing the concrete. And she raised her hand, and she clutched the aluminum chain fence that sort of surrounded the sepulcher. She bowed her head, she extended her hand, and then she began to pray out loud in Arabic to Allah. She prayed for them, she prayed for us, she prayed for peace here in the United States, in her homeland, Afghanistan, and in every place where violence tears our hearts and our hopes to shreds. She was, for me, the coming to terms with an unsettling question. Could I, in the midst of wars without end, still believe that peace is possible? She was, for me, a living sign of solidarity, paving the pathway to peace. Our Dominican tradition of peace building is rooted in the conviction that our God-given relatedness is the single and most powerful prevention, antidote, and healer of violence, especially the violence of the war. In the run-up to the war with Iraq, Dominicans from the United States traveled to Iraq. The mission was in part to express our family's resistance to the sanctions which prohibited such travel and exchange between the people of the United States and the people of Iraq. We also embarked on the journey to Iraq because our Dominican family in Iraq, over 150 Iraqi Dominican sisters of Mosul and the Roman congregation, represented in our discernment the Iraqi people wrongly vilified and victimized by U.S. propaganda and the influence of some of the nation's economic and political power brokers. Throughout the war, the Dominican family leveraged we leveraged our networks and credibility as church leaders, teachers, lawyers, justice promoters, and we communally committed, to see the parallel to the Hispaniola homily, we communally committed to unmask and counter the lies that were leading to the war. Principally, but not exclusively, it was American Dominican sisters, together with our Iraqi Dominican sisters, who crisscrossed this country and the world, indeed, to preach, to address the media, to present workshops, composed written and, and, um, and oral presentations at the United Nations and other places, we were committed to a policy change through lobbying in Washington. What we commonly found was that exposure to Iraqis who were Catholics, as well as Dominican sisters, was enough to shatter the public stereotypes of Iraqis so carefully constructed by our government and reinforced by the media. We are one human family, and our responsibility is to foster right relationship. That is the simple and transformative message which the U.S. and Iraqi sisters witnessed. We had a pin that we wore that said, I have family in Iraq. I can't tell you how many times I had that pin on in the New York City subways, and people said, oh, do you have a son in there? And I said, no, no, I have sisters there, and so do you. Sisters and brothers, you know. We get into this thing. But it's amazing how just something like that turns people, their thinking, you know, just around and it opens a conversation. One of the most
most un unforgettable homilies that Dominicans preached during the time of the war was delivered by another very, very small band of Dominicans composed of Dominican laity, sisters, and fathers. And they publicly did a homily by fasting on war alone for a month at Union, uh, Union Square Park in New York City on 14th Street. Thousands of Dominicans, however, visited them from 36 countries, including the Master General of the Order. Dominicans sat with them all the time, joined them in prayer and fasting for a halt to the war. And thousands of travelers, if you've been to 14th Street, you know it's a crossroads, sort of in Manhattan, were impacted by the presence of these Dominicans and students from NYU and nearby Columbia and universities, as well as artists and social activists, business people of all stripes, as well as the homeless, were also with those Dominicans and found in them a holy preaching for peace. The Dominican presence standing in solidarity for peace at the entrance of the Union Square subway stop was in the words of one of our Iraqi Dominican sisters, the only ray of hope penetrating those dark days of war. Now while truth uh, withdrawal signals the war's ends, and for most Americans the fact is that the war is not over. It's, it might be over for us, but not over for the Iraqi refugees, for example, who are displaced within the country and also within the neighboring war-torn lands of Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon. American Dominicans have also been traveling to these cities in the Middle East, where Iraqis linger in limbo. Together with our Iraqi sisters whose own families are among the 2.5 million Iraqis who are displaced, the focus of Dominican peacebuilding work continues. Today, Dominicans are engaged in ongoing efforts to grow awareness about the plight of the Iraqi refugees while lobbying and advocating for Iraqi refugee resettlement policies in the United States that actualize our government's responsibility towards these casualties of our war. Of course, the other victims of war are those wounded warriors that are now returning from the battlefield to face another battle here in Perhaps other risk magnets will be among those schools where these men and women veterans will use their hard-earned benefits. And perhaps it will be here <coughs> where they will carve with the tools of study and the gift of your compassionate care, a promising future, and a pathway to peace. As we strive to integrate the Dominican mission of peace building into our lives and work at Alberta's Magnus College, let us consider questions such as these. How do we, as members of a Dominican college, engage our students in a critical ethical reflection on the wars just waged in Iraq and Afghanistan? Where and how does the heresy of dualism exist for them in the logic of these wars? What can students learn from this kind of study that will sharpen their understanding, enrich their wisdom, and build their capacity to be promoters of peace, healers of wounds, restorers of right relationship? How can so many people perish so cruelly. This was the question asked by a Dominican community reflecting on the casualties of violence in the dawning days of the 16th century. What will be the impact of this question on these dawning days of the 21st century, and what will be the response? How can the spirit of Dominican tradition, evident in the Hispaniola homily, become so evident in the university classroom, the boardroom, the athletic and student centers, how will the Dominican tradition of human rights, sustainable and ethical social, economic, environmental development, and peace building manifest itself here and across our Dominican colleges and universities? How can our Dominican tradition transform the contemporary manifestation of the heresy of dualism in our nation 